20,000 Leagues Under the Sea by Jules Verne. Part 2. Chapter 5. The Arabian Tunnel. That same evening, in 21 degrees 30 minutes north latitude, the Nautilus floated on the surface of the sea, approaching the Arabian coast. I saw Jagat, the most important counting house of Egypt, Syria, Turkey, and India. I distinguished clearly enough its buildings, the vessels anchored at the quays, and those whose draught of water obliged them to anchor in the ropes. The sun, rather low on the horizon, struck full on the houses of the town, bringing out their whiteness. Outside, some wooden cabins, and some made of reeds, showed the quarter inhabited by the Bedouins. Soon Jidda was shut out from view by the shadows of night, and the Nautilus found herself under water slightly phosphorescent. The next day, the 10th of February, we sighted several ships running to windward. The Nautilus returned to its submarine navigation, but at noon, when her bearings were taken, the sea being deserted, she rose again to her water line. Accompanied by Ned and Consil, I seated myself on the platform. The coast on the eastern side looked like a mass faintly printed upon a damp fog. We were leaning on the sides of the Pindus, talking of one thing and another. When at land, stretching out his hand toward the spot on the sea, said, Do you see anything there, sir? No, Ned, I replied, but I have not your eyes, you know. Look well, said Ned, there, on the starboard beam, about the height of the lantern. Do you not see a mass which seems to move? Certainly, said I. After close attention, I see something like a long black body on the top of the water. And certainly before long the black object was not more than a mile from us. It looked like a great sand bank deposited in the open sea. It was a gigantic dugong. Ned Land looked eagerly. His eyes shone with covetousness at the sight of the animal. His hand seemed ready to harpoon it. One would have thought he was awaiting the moment to throw himself into the sea and attack it in its element. At this instant Captain Natmo appeared on the platform. He saw the dugong, understood the Canadian's attitude, and, addressing him, said, If you held the harpoon just now, Masterland, would it not burn your hand? Just so, sir. And you would not be sorry to go back, for one day to your trade of a fisherman and to add this citation to the list of those you have already killed. I should not, sir. Well, you can't try. Thank you, sir, said Nedland, his eyes flaming. Only, continued the captain, I advise you for your own say not to miss the creature. Is the dugong dangerous to attack? I asked, in spite of the Canadian's shrug of the shoulders. Yes, replied the captain. Sometimes the animal turns upon its assailants and overturns their boat. But for Master Land this danger is not to be feared. His eye is prompt, his arm sure. 
At this moment seven men of the crew, mute and immovable as ever, mounted the platform. One carried a harpoon and a line similar to those employed in catching whales. The pindus was lifted from the bridge, pulled from its socket, and let down into the sea. Six oarsmen took their seats, and the coxswain went to the tiller. Ned, Consile, and I went to the back of the boat. You are not coming, Captain. I asked. No, sir, but I wish you good sport. The boat put off, and, lifted by the six rowers, drew rapidly towards the Duong, which floated about two miles from the Nautilus. Arrived some cables length from the cetacean, the speed slackened, and the oars dipped noiselessly into the quiet waters. Neckland, harpoon in hand stood in the fore part of the boat. The harpoon used for striking the whale is generally attached to a very long cord which runs out rapidly as the wounded creature draws it after him. But here the cord was not more than ten fathoms long, and the extremity was attached to a small barrel which, by floating was to show the course the dugong took under the water. I stood and carefully watched the Canadian's adversary. This dugong, which also bears the name of the holocaur, closely resembles the manatee, its oblong body terminated in the lengthened tail, and its lateral fins in perfect fingers. Its difference from the manatee consisted in its upper jaw, which was armed with two long and pointed teeth which formed on each side diverging tusks. This dugong which Neb Land was preparing to attack was of colossal dimensions. It was more than seven yards long. It did not move, and seemed to be sleeping on the waves which circumstance made it easier to capture. The boat approached within six yards of the animal. The oars rested on the road locks. I have rose. Neckland, his body thrown a little back, brandished the harpoon in his experienced hand. Suddenly a hissing noise was heard and the dugong disappeared. The harpoon, although thrown with great force, had apparently only struck the water. Curse it! exclaimed the Canadian furiously. I have missed it. No, said I. The creature is wounded. Look at the blood, but your weapon has not stuck in his body. My harpoon, my harpoon, cried Neckland. The sailors rode on, and the coxswain made for the floating barrel. The harpoon regained, we followed in pursuit of the animal. The latter came now and then to the surface to breathe. Its wound had not weakened it, for it shot onwards with great rapidity. The boat, rowed by strong arms, flew on its track. Several times it approached within some few yards, and the Canadian was ready to strike, but the dugong made off with a sudden plunge, and it was impossible to reach it. Imagine the passion which excited impatient Neckland. He hurled at the unfortunate creature the most energetic expletives in the English tongue. For my part, I was only vexed to see the dugong escape all our attacks. We pursued it without relaxation for an hour, 
and I began to think it would prove difficult to capture. When the animal, possessed with the perverse idea of vengeance of which he had cause to repent, turned upon the pindus and assailed us in its turn. This maneuver did not escape the Canadian. Look out! He cried. The coxswain said some words in his outlandish tongue, doubtless warning the men to keep on their guard. The dugong came within twenty feet of the boat, stopped, sniffed the air briskly with its large nostrils not pierced at the extremity, but in the upper part of its muzzle. Then, taking the spring, he threw himself upon us. The Pindus could not avoid the shock, and half upset, shipped at least two tons of water, which had to be emptied. But, thanks to the coxswain, we caught it sideways, not full front, so we were not quite overturned. While Nathlan, clinging to the boats, Delabor the gigantic animal with blows from his harpoon. The creature's teeth were buried in the gunwale, and it lifted the whole thing out of the water, as a lion does a roebuck. We were upset over one another, and I know not how the adventure would have ended, if the Canadian, still enraged with the beast, had not struck it to the heart. I heard its teeth grind on the iron plate, and the dugong disappeared, carrying the harpoon with him. But the barrel soon returned to the surface, and shortly after the body of the animal turned on its back. The boat came up with it, took it in tow and made straight for the Nautilus. It required tackle of enormous strength to hoist the dugong onto the platform. It weighed 10,000 pounds. The next day, 11th February, the larder of the Nautilus was enriched by some more delicate game. A flight of sea swallows rested on the Nautilus. It was a species of the Sternid Nilotica, peculiar to Egypt. Its beak is black, head gray and pointed, the eye surrounded by white spots, the back, wings, and tail of a grayish color, the belly and throat white, and claws red. They also took some dozen of Nile ducks, the wild bird of high flavor, its throat and upper part of the head white with black spots. About five o'clock in the evening we sighted to the north the Cape of Ras Mahamid. This cape forms the extremity of Arabia Patria, comprised between the Gulf of Suez and the Gulf of Aqaba. The Nautilus penetrated into the Straits of Jubal, which leads to the Gulf of Suez. I distinctly saw a high mountain, towering between the two gulfs of Ras Mahamid. It was Mount Horeb, that Sinai at the top of which Moses saw God face to face. That six o'clock the Nautilus, sometimes floating sometimes emerged, passed some distance from toward, situated at the end of the bay, the waters of which seemed tinted with red, an observation already made by Captain Natmo. Then night fell in the midst of a heavy silence, sometimes broken by the cries of the pelican and other night birds and the noise of the waves breaking upon the shore, chafing against the rocks, or the panting of some far-off steamer beating the waters of the gulf with its noisy paddles.
From eight to nine o'clock the Nautilus remained some fathoms under the water. According to my calculation we must have been very near Suez. Through the panel of the saloon I saw the bottom of the rocks brilliantly lit up by our electric lamp. We seemed to be leaving the straits behind us more and more. At a quarter past nine, the vessel having returned to the surface, I mounted the platform. Most impatient to pass through Captain Natmo's tunnel. I could not stay in one place, so came to breathe the fresh night air. Soon in the shadow I saw a pale light, half discolored by the fog, shining about a mile from us. A floating lighthouse, said someone near me. I turned, and saw the captain. It is the floating light of Suez. He continued. It will not be long before we gain the entrance of the tunnel. The entrance cannot be easy. No, sir. For that reason I am accustomed to go into the steersman's cage and myself direct our course. And now, if you will go down, am Aratnax, that Nautilus is going under the waves and will not return to the surface until we have passed through the Arabian Tunnel. Captain Nemo led me towards the central staircase. Halfway down he opened a door, traversed the upper deck, and landed in the pilot's cage, which it may be remembered rose at the extremity of the platform. It was a cabin measuring six feet square, very much like that occupied by the pilot on the steamboats of the Mississippi or Hudson. In the midst worked the wheel, placed vertically, and caught to the tiller rope, which ran to the back of the Nautilus. Four light ports with lenticular glasses let in a group in the partition of the cabin, allowed the man at the wheel to see in all directions. This cabin was dark, but soon my eyes accustomed themselves to the obscurity, and I perceived the pilot, a strong man, with his hands resting on the spokes of the wheel. Outside, the sea appeared vividly lit up by the lantern, which shed its rays from the back of the cabin to the other extremity of the platform. Now, said Captain Natmo, let us try to make our passage. Electric wires connected the pilot's cage with the machinery room and from there the captain could communicate simultaneously to his Nautilus the direction and the speed. He pressed a metal knob, and at once the speed of the screw diminished. I looked in silence at the high straight wall we were running by at this moment, the immovable base of the massive sandy coast. We followed it thus for an hour only some few yards off. Captain Natmo did not take his eye from the knob, suspended by its two concentric circles in the cabin. At a simple gesture, the pilot modified the course of the Nautilus every instant. I had placed myself at the port scuttle and saw some magnificent substructures of coral, zoophytes, seaweed, and fucus, agitating their enormous claws, which stretched out from the fissures of the rock. At a quarter past ten, the captain himself took the helm. A large gallery, black and deep, opened before us. The Nautilus went boldly into it. A strange roaring was heard round its sides. 
it was the waters of the Red Sea, which the incline of the tunnel precipitated violently towards the Mediterranean. The Nautilus went with the torrent, rapid as an arrow, in spite of the efforts of the machinery, which, in order to offer more effective resistance, beat the waves with reversed screws. On the walls of the narrow passage I could see nothing but brilliant rays, straight lines, furrows of fire, traced by the great speed, under the brilliant electric light. My heart beat fast. At thirty-five minutes past ten, Captain Nemo quitted the helm, and, turning to me, said, the Mediterranean. In less than twenty minutes, the Nautilus, carried along by the torrent, had passed through the Isthmus of Suez.